Good morning, judges. We are Team Thick Wires uh, from Quartron Institution. Here are our team members, and let's begin with mechanical engineering. Each component, layout, and system on our robot is meticulously designed over a multi-step iterative process that's unique to the Thick Wires ethos. Careful thought and consideration is placed into each of the robot's intricate geometries using a simple yet sophisticated design that uses optimal performance, reliability, and dependability. This is the thick wires robot of a tried and true layout that's been developed and refined over half a decade of experience. In this, the fifth iteration of our robot, the ease with which we adapted our designs to the ever changing robot car landscape, speaks to the timeless versatility of our iconic design. For our final year of Roll Cup, we focus on fine tuning our original philosophy. This robot is the combination of thousands of hours in relentless pursuit of mechanical perfection, the most deliberate evolution of our founding design. As for our layout, we use a split cross wheelbase, a central battery slot, and a camera and mirror as this design has stood the test of time. We've adapted to the reduced size limit of competition leading miniaturization. Here are all the AutoCAD files of all the major layers on our robot. And this year, we decided to focus on modularity. And nobody does repairability like us. The Thickwise robot is designed so that every component can be removed and swapped out with minimal steps and simple tools so that even in the heat of competition, we can repair our robot easily if need be. As for our camera, as for our camera vision, we use a conical mirror with a hyperbolic tip, show, showing the ball with minimal distortion, whether it's far or near. A solid piece of precision new aluminium is secured with see-through pillars to reduce obstruction, and the camera is lower than we've ever made, allowing a wider mirror with shallower sides. And this year, with a camera so low, the true hole compartments would have, the true hole components would have damaged the battery. Hence, we opted to use castellated boardlets for the Tinsy 4.0 and the Open MV so that we can lift the pins of the main circuit board. And here are the other castellated boardlets around our PCB. And this year, our screw holes were padded with a solid piece of drilled HASL material as opposed to the, the usual uh, FR4 material. And this protects the PCB and its components from being crushed or scratched by screws and pillars. These are the different types of visors. And on the right is uh, more of the bashers on our robot. As for our dribbler, this is the most compact dribbler we've ever made. With a powerful brushless DC motor that powers a set of precision molded silicon rollers through durable new brass gears. The ball held with competition leading stability and strength. The ball has held with competition leading stability and strength even when the robot is moving backwards. And in order to do this, we uh, in order to do this, the groundwork is actually uh, created by some of our seniors. And another notable point was that the solenoid is actually pushed through the bottom PCB due to the size constraint. Here's a video of our dribbler. And yes, uh, that concludes the mechanical engineering for Team Thick Wires. Now for electrical engineering. Here's the overview. We have a top layer, a central layer, and a bottom layer. And in the middle, we have some miscellaneous layers. So unlike last year where we only had a single bar converter for the 3.3 volt line and 5 volt line each, this year we opted to have isolated power supplies for each layer. Each PCB has its own dedicated step down for 5 volts and a 3.3 volt line. Hence, any shorting or over voltage on one layer wouldn't affect components on the other layer. This proved to be useful on, later on when we shorted the STM32 on the bottom layer about 3 times and when we shorted the Tinsy on the central layer about 2 times. <laughs> Last year, we realized that regular jumper cables were extremely reliable, especially since they needed to be soldered, tinted, and housed. And if any of these steps were done, were, weren't done properly, the connections would easily come loose. Hence, this year, we opted to use FFC cables. They are thin, compact, and plug-in reliably. The only drawback was that it was slightly challenging to solder the FFC connector. And for the bottom PCB, we have uh, some bar converters and a boost converter for the kicker. And the 32 light, sen 32 light sensor light ring supported by two analog multiplexers. We use the VNH 1519s as our drivers due to our chip shortage, but to desolder from old boards and risk overheating and killing them. However, due to our superior soldering skills, we didn't kill any. And to facilitate the high current draw, we had two options. One was to run really thick wires throughout the robot, as other teams have done, and two was to stick with regular PCB tracers and risk crosstalk interference and the PCB exploding. We uh, dis eventually decided to go with regular PCB tracers, and we used an online PCB trace width calculator to ensure that they were thick enough 
and ran all sensitive traces on a separate layer. This seemed to prove effective since our PCB didn't explode and high current draw uh, from the motors didn't seem to affect any high speed communication on the bottom layer yet. Uh, last year we ran about 26 wires between the bottom and middle layer. So this year we utilized the STM32 microcontroller to read the light sensors and write to the drivers. This minimizes the number of wires we need from 26 down all the way to 6. And combined the fact that we use FSC cables instead of jumper cables, our interlayer connections are reliable and compact. As for the kicker, it exploded in front of our face last year due to the back EMF. So this year we utilized a short key dial in a resistor in series to dissipate the back EMF as heat safely. However, there was yet another issue which was that when the Tinsy turned the kicker on, it would blow up. And we soon found out that this was because the Tinsy can only output around 4 milliamps per pin. And also its logic level, which is 3.3 volts, is not high enough to fully turn on the MOSFET. So in order to solve this, we stacked transistors and added resistors in series with the gain of the MOSFET so that the current and voltage from the Tinsy to turn on was limited. And now for the central layer. Uh, as mentioned before, we use an isolated power supplies and we use a Tinsy 4.0 as our main microcontroller since quote unquote its CPU performance is many times faster than typical 32 bit microcontrollers. And we also didn't need the extra pins the 4.1 could provide. And for communications between the Tinsy 4 and the STM32 on the other layers, we use serial since I2C was prone to noise and interference, as we also found out later on. Uh, for Bluetooth, we use the HC-05, and for the camera version, we use the OpenMV H7. And now for the top layer. Now we have, on the top layer, we have two dedicated STM32s, one for the TOFs to prevent its uh, 33 millisecond lag from impacting the rest of our robot performance, and one for the IMU. And previously, we ran the I2C wires from the IMU down to the TNZ4, but we realized that this resulted in the IMU randomly crashing. And not only that, but when it did work, it drifted by a lot. And this is because the I2C lines were particularly sensitive to noise, especially those created by the high current Dramax models. So to overcome this, the IMU has its own dedicated STM32 placed as close as possible, along with completely curved tracers and no copper pores nearby. Now onto software. This year, a major change that we made was to make the shift from Arduino IDE to VS Code Taskpad, that for Mayo. This was especially convenient for us, as it allowed us to easily develop code for different boards, mainly our STM32s and our TNZs, without having to change the upload protocol each time. Furthermore, it allowed us to take advantage of VS Code's useful features such as Git integration and dark mode. Now I'll be going over the different programs run by our uh, sub-microcontrollers. For the STM32 on layer 1, it has two main purposes. Firstly, line control, and secondly, motor control, where, where it writes um, code to control the holonomic movement for our robot. Line control consists of two main aspects, line tracking and line avoidance, which are enabled by the ring of light sensors we have on our motor PCB. Line tracking involves finding the angle closest to the target angle of the robot's movement so that the robot can always stay on the line while moving towards whatever target it is trying to track, such as the ball. As for line avoidance, we calculate the angle of the line relative to the robot and move uh, in the opposite direction to its angle in order to avoid the white lines in the field and stay within bounds. As for our layer 4 STM32s, we mainly use them to read our sensors. Uh, we have one for the BNO055 IMU and another one for our four TOF sensors. This allowed us to greatly reduce our lead time as we dedicated the sensor reading task to our separate microcontrollers and sent this uh, data over to the TNZ using serial. We use the OpenMV H7 as our camera as it is able to achieve a relatively high FPS of around 60 when tracking both the ball and the goals. We also employed a Kalman filter to predict the position of the ball when the ball is occluded by either the pillars on our robot or by other robots to give us a rough idea of where the ball is even if it can't be directly seen. Furthermore, we also map uh, since the coordinates um, obtained from our mirror are not linear, we remap them using an online um, polynomial regression tool to get real world coordinates instead of just pixel coordinates. We use the TNC 4.0 as our main microcontroller, which handles most of the logic and receives all the data from other microcontrollers using UI and writes uh, movement, uh, movement data directly to the STM32 on layer 1. For our striker program, it's relatively simple. If the ball is not seen, we will track the ball using the orbit function. And once the ball has been caught in the robot's river, it will track the goal using the uh, similar orbit function by moving towards the center of the goal, avoiding any opponent's robots in the process. If the 
target that the robot is trying to track is not seen, it will move towards the center of the goal for a clearer shot. And once the striker is close enough to the goal and has a clear shot, we will activate the solar to quickly creep the ball into the goal. For our goalie, we simply move left and right along the penalty area line in order to prevent fully entering it. And we use a PID controller to control the speed at which it aligns itself to the ball, so it's able to quickly respond to any changes in the ball position. When the robot is uh, not in, when the ball is not due of the robot, it will simply return to the center of the goal as, uh, as a defensive position. For localization, we use two different methods. Firstly, we uh, have a method of localization involving our TOF sensors, where we take the measurements of each TOF and compare them to the to the real life known distances of the height and width of the field in order to obtain a bounding box for where the robot could be on the field. We also have a method of localization involving our camera, where we take the vector pointing to each goal and sum them up in order to obtain a vector pointing towards the center of the field. By converting this uh, field center vector into Cartesian coordinates from polar coordinates, we are able to obtain a rough position of where the robot is on the field. And based on the relative uncertainties of each of these methods, such as the size of the bounding box, we are able to get a more accurate estimate of where the robot would be on the field by combining these two, um, uh, by combining methods involving these two sensors. The main applications of our localization are to slow the robot down as it approaches the sides of the field, so it doesn't go out of bounds. It also allows the robot to accurately move to neutral points on the field if the target's tracking is not seen. Finally, we have our Bluetooth strategies, which are enabled by the HC05 modules on both of our robots. The main fu uh, function of our Bluetooth modules is to enable role switching, allowing for more dynamic gameplay. Um, we switch roles in under two main conditions. Firstly, if the goalie is closer to the ball than the striker, it takes advantage of this by becoming the striker and, and um, getting the current striker to change into a goalie. This allows the goalie to convert its defensive position into an offensive position and place greater pressure on the opponent and keep the action on their side of the field rather than ours. Secondly, if the striker goes out of the field, the goalie will become a striker as we believe that having an offensive presence on the field is uh, very important so that we can continue to score goals even if one robot is out. Another function of the Bluetooth modules is that it allows, it allows us to share data between robots. Most importantly, uh, it allows us to share ball data so that the other robot can see, can have a rough idea of where the ball is, even if it can't be seen directly. Uh, that's it for our software, and thank you for listening to our presentation.